Thanks for having me. My name is Tim. I'm from Ansible Works. Uh, I run the services and support organization there. And is the volume OK? It's a little boomy to my ears, but all right. Uh, so I'm going to give you guys a quick overview of, of what Ansible is. Uh, we'll have a, a demo of, of some of the interesting functionality. Um, and then hopefully we'll have some time for, for questions, if you folks have questions. So f first of all, how many people have heard of Ansible and, and know generally what it is? OK, so I've got kind of a, kind of a fresh crowd here. Uh, Ansible is an open source tool. It's, a, it's an IT automation, uh, orchestration, and configuration management system um, that draws a lot of ideas from, from, other, uh, from older tools um, and, and brings, uh, brings a lot of things together, uh, concepts such as, as orchestration, which, which when we say orchestration, we mean manipulating an entire tier of application or an entire application stack, which may be made up of multiple tiers. Uh, in a coordinated way, so as opposed to sort of a one system at a time approach to configuration and, and, and automation of tasks, Ansible can uh, coordinate those operations throughout the system. And, and we'll show you an example of this um, as well. Ansible can talk to anything that has an API or exposes a, an SSH interface. So you can use Ansible to talk to your networking devices, your load balancers, firewalls, switches, and so on, as, as well as your, your typical Unix or, or Linux machines. Um, Ansible doesn't do Windows yet, but uh, now that I know Bruce, hopefully we can make that happen in a way that makes sense. So I'm not going to go into detail about what continuous deployment is. Uh, with, with this crowd, I probably don't need to. Um, for the purposes of, of this discussion, I, I like to think of continuous deployment as, as frequent application updates, frequent unattended application updates, the ability to maybe even several times a day or several, time, several times an hour update your, your application in the field from you know, code committed to rolled out to your customers. And, and to do that, to, to get to a continuous deployment um, environment, I think there are some characteristics of the tools that you choose uh, that are really important. Um, number one, a, a tool should be easy to use. Uh, dealing with your, de with your deployment tools and your configuration tools should not be a full-time job on its own. It, it should be, the, the tool should work for you. It should be uh, easy to get started to do basic things, and it should be possible to do complicated things without becoming you know, an expert in, in any particular tool. Um, it should be non-intrusive, so the tool should work with, uh, with your workflow, the way that you've decided to, to deploy your application, and it shouldn't force you into certain layers of abstraction that may not make sense for your, for your application or for your environment or just the way that you think. Um, a tool that you use for continuous deployment should, uh, should be predictable. You should be able to, to trust the results. There, should, there shouldn't be any sort of undefined behavior or uh, you know, ordering, uh, ordering weirdness that, that might inter interrupt your, uh, your, your, um, your flow of work. And ideally, a tool like this would be powerful and be able to handle most of the tasks that you, that you give it. You, you shouldn't have to necessarily bring to bear a lot of different tools and duct tape them together. Uh, continuous or, or configuration management, orchestration, and, and general automation tasks, uh, deployment of applications are, are all really closely related. And, uh, and it'd be nice to have a tool that does all, th all three or, or four, depending on how you count, all, th all of those tasks in, in one tool. Um, so you might not be too surprised that uh, Ansible satisfies, in, in my opinion, uh, most of these requirements, or all of these requirements. Uh, some of the things that are different about Ansible compared to other uh, configuration management, deployment, and orchestration tools, Ansible is very simple. Um, we like to say you can automate in plain English. That's not really true. It's not really plain English. But it's as close as we can get. It's, a, it's a really a human-readable format. And I'll show you some examples of the, of the playbook format uh, that we've developed to, to really to express your configurations, to express your, your automation tasks. Um, there's minimal jargon in the system. Uh, we, we try to keep the, the language pretty clear and, and keep, the, keep the terminology straightforward without introducing a lot of, of uh, specific um, sort of jargony words and terms to, to describe what's going on. Uh, when you're writing an Ansible configuration, 
you're not writing code. Uh, there are very few sort of traditional language constructs. It is a, D, it is a, a DSL, a domain-specific language, the playbook format, but you're not, you're not writing code, you're not writing loops and, and so on. Um, and if you, if you get to the point where you feel like you want to, we've, we've built some mechanisms to, to help you get away from that and get back to sort of the, the pragmatic approach of describing your, your infrastructure as, as data. And we've taken a really pragmatic approach to abstractions. Um, one thing that some people, when they first encounter Ansible, they, they wonder, you know, how do you, how do you abstract away this idea or abstract away this idea to, to different levels? And, and we really try and encourage people not to do that uh, and, and just, you know, build your configurations in a way that's, that's easy to read and, and easy to understand for someone who's looking at it six months down the line or someone who doesn't necessarily know Ansible. Um, and we think we've, we've pretty well uh, achieved that goal. Ansible is, is secure, uh, not because we're security experts by any means, but because uh, we have explicitly decided not to become security experts and we rely entirely on, uh, on SSH communication by default. So basically we, we piggy Ansible piggybacks on your existing SSH infrastructure for connecting to the remote hosts under management. Um, OpenSSH is probably, if, if not the most uh, well-reviewed, it probably is the most well-reviewed piece of crypto software out there. And if there, if there are any problems, if there are any, uh, any uh, vulnerabilities, those will be closed very quickly. And the same can't be said for something, uh, something like Ansible, which doesn't have quite as many eyes on it. So we, we, uh, we gain the, the benefit of, of all of that. There's no custom public key, uh, uh, key infrastructure necessary to use Ansible. Um, and there's no agent running on the managed servers. Uh, this is a big, a big difference between Ansible and some other tools. Ansible is completely agentless. Uh, we, we push, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the architecture overview, but we push a, a small module out to the remote host per task, and it runs and then deletes itself and return, or returns the result and then deletes itself, which means implementing Ansible gives you uh, no additional tax, attack surface uh, for your managed machines. Um, this also means that we can coexist with, a, with other configuration tools. We're not going to conflict with a puppet agent or a, or a chef agent or anything like that. And you can, use, uh, you can use Ansible in conjunction with those or other tools, um, maybe you know, BMC Blade Logic or, or Ops, Opsware or, or whatever. And uh, I mentioned this previously, but, but Ansible covers um, more of the more automation tasks than other tools. So, Ansible was designed from the very beginning to be able to handle not only the, the declarative configuration management where you say, on this class of systems, these files must exist and these packages must be installed at this version. And, and Ansible, can, you can express those kind of declarative ideas in Ansible, and Ansible will, will make it so. But you can also very simply uh, define steps of tasks and just you know basically take a shell script and translate it to Ansible and, and, and this might be a good way to do your software deployment say check out your code from Git copy it to the server restart the service that sort of uh, uh, sort of um, that sort of uh, deployment type of task is, is very easy to accomplish with Ansible as well you don't have to translate that into you know, the item potent resource model declarative state type of idea. You can mix and match the two, which is pretty powerful. And along with that, you can address um, tiers of machines as a, as a group, and you can, you can do it in a coordinated sense. And I'll show you an example of this where you manage a load balancer in a monitoring system during a rolling up, upgrade of a, of, a, of a software application. So here's an overview of the architecture. Um, Ansible runs on a, on a machine somewhere. This is your management machine. There's a couple exceptions to that. I'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, Ansible runs in, on the management machine. It has an inventory of your systems. And the most basic form of inventory is just a flat file of host names in, in groups and subgroups with associated variables. There's other places to get inventory. Uh, there are a bunch of modules. Ansible has about 120 modules. We kind of take the batteries included approach, kind of in a, in a Python sense. So if someone contributes a module um, and it's generally useful and high quality code, we will bring it into, into Ansible and we'll test it and we'll, we'll maintain it. 
So there's modules from everything from MySQL to uh, OpenStack Quantum and, and so on and so forth. Um, so you've got your playbook, which operates against uh, things in your inventory. Uh, when you run a playbook or when you run an ad hoc command, which is just a way to uh, issue a command across a set of servers, Ansible will connect via SSH, copy the module over, the module will run, the results will be returned, and Ansible will move on. Uh, there's another mechanism of connection. So there's actually, uh, the, the connection mechanism is pluggable. The default is SSH, but we have a zero MQ based mechanism, which is about, it's about 10 times faster than SSH. So if you have uh, you know, thousands of hosts and you're operating and you're hitting them over and over again with, with various, uh, various configuration tasks, you'll probably see some benefit from switching to the zero MQ mechanism. We do a little bootstrap to install the zero MQ. It doesn't remain on the system. It actually times out after a certain period of time. Um, so we kind of maintain the agentless state that way as well. Uh, in our experience, though, most people don't need to, to use the zero MQ mechanism. For most people, most tasks, uh, you're, not, you're not hitting all of your thousands of hosts over and over again in quick succession. If you are, then you might need to use 0MQ. Most people use SSH. Um, we can also talk to networking devices as well. We can manage uh, load balancers. There are modules for uh, F5, Netscaler, um, Nginx, and, and so on in the system. Um, and of course, uh, it wouldn't be 2013 without mentioning cloud. We can talk to cloud instances uh, just as easily as any other. In fact, one of the benefits of, of the SSH connection is that um, most cloud instances, whether they're EC2 or Eucalyptus or, or OpenStack, have the, the default connection mechanism is, is a, an SSH key. And it's injected into the instance when it boots. Ansible can take that, SS, that private key and, and connect right away without any other bootstrapping. Um, Ansible's about a year and a half old. It's an open source project. It's fairly young. Uh, we've had about uh, 13 releases, I think. Um, and we've, we're seeing some, some really great adoption from the community. We've, we, have, uh, we have almost 200 unique contributors, which, is, which I think is pretty impressive for a project of its age. And I think one of the reasons why we have so many is because it's very easy to contribute to the system. Um, if you're just building a, a small module, um, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to get up to speed. And you can build a module for your task in a, in a couple of hours. And then hopefully that will be useful for other people as well. Um, we, uh, we've seen a, a great uptake. The, the Fedora infrastructure project is, is using Ansible for all of their configuration tasks, uh, among a bunch of others. And if you want to know more, call me afterwards. I, I, won't, I won't go into too much detail here. I want to stay fairly technical. Uh, but we're pretty excited about the, about the interest that, that, w that we've seen in the system. Um, this is our sort of batteries included list. <laughs> uh, there'll be a quiz at the end, so, so pay attention. We've got modules from everything from basic file and, and command execution tasks to specific stuff like RabbitMQ management, Django management, uh, a bunch of OpenStack stuff is in there. Um, and these, these modules are what gives Ansible the kind of the, the power of the playbook language. So you can write a playbook that's, that, that, that only uses one module, maybe the command module to execute remote commands. But a lot of the power and the expressiveness comes from these modules that are built into the system and allow you to do, to, to, to do useful things like manage your MySQL databases and so on from just a couple of lines of, uh, of playbook content. Some of the most common modules that you'll see, of course, are package management. So one of the, the things you almost always do to a system when it boots up is you install certain packages on it. So of course, there are modules for, uh, for YUM and apt and, and Arch Linux and Mac ports and some, some FreeBSD stuff. Uh, you, can, you can specify that a package must be installed or must be absent. You can, you can ask for certain uh, uh, version numbers of packages if you have specific requirements. So that's kind of that declarative sense of, of package management there. And then the, 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 the less declarative stuff, the, the command execution, you've got command and shell. Command just runs a command on the remote server via SSH. Shell actually passes it to the shell, so you can use you know, shell constructs and so forth. Um, service management is for uh, init, uh, init script uh, management, restart services, start services, et cetera. And of course, file handling, you need to copy files to your servers. Those, those modules are there. Um, and and these, are, these are also more declarative, copy and template, 
where you say this file must exist and you and uh, and Ansible will will make it so if if not if it if the file is already there and doesn't need to be changed then Ansible will uh, will not change anything and then uh, for for deployment um, one of the common patterns that we've seen is people deploying directly from from your source control so we've got modules for the the various popular source control management uh, tools out there so here's an example of a, of a very simple host inventory. And when I get into the demo a little bit, I will, uh, I'll, show you, um, I'll show you a real life example. This is super simple. You've got three hosts. They're in two groups. You can target your web servers, or you can target your database servers with, a, with an operation, or you can target all the hosts. Um, now, in a real environment, a flat text file of inventory is not going to be very scalable. So we've got other inventory sources. You can source from, uh, from your EC2 cloud. Uh, and they'll be automatically grouped based on tag, based on uh, availability zone, et cetera. And we have similar modules for Rackspace and OpenStack. Uh, if, you're, uh, if you're using Cobbler, um, we can source inventory from there. And it's pretty easy to write a custom connector to a, another kind of CMDB if you have something, uh, something uh, that we don't have built-in support for. So let's talk a little bit about playbooks. Um, I'm going to show you a demo soon, and that'll that'll probably uh, it'll be useful to understand a few of these things. Um, you've got a playbook. Uh, a playbook is the the top level descriptor for your automation content. A playbook is is made up of plays. Plays target an individual set of hosts. So you you might have a play for your web servers. You'd have a play for your database servers. You'd have a play for your load balancers, and you could have a common play that applied to everything. Um, each play has a list of tasks. Uh, the tasks call modules. And the, the, everything happens in, in strict, uh, strict order, the way you specify it in your playlist. So there's no, there's no sort of you know, undefined dependency ordering or anything. If you need, uh, a de de if you need to, to express the idea of dependencies, you just have to turn it into a step-by-step into -step list. Um, there's one exception to the step-by-step to the -step idea. Uh, that's the idea of handlers. If you're, if you're going through a, a list of tasks and you need to, need to trigger something, say, say you're configuring Apache and you need to change something in the main, the main Apache configuration file and then um, add a virtual host directive to another file. Uh, using the declarative mechanisms in Ansible, you would need to, to somehow signal that Apache needs to be restarted if the file's changed. So what you can do is you can set up, you can trigger a handler on each of the tasks that might modify the config file. If the config file does not need to be modified, nothing will be changed and nothing will be, will be restarted. But if one of those tasks or both of those tasks actually does change a config file, then the handler will file at, fire at the end of the play restarting Apache. So you're not going to get duplicate restarts um, or anything like that. And this is, really the, this is really the only jargon you have to learn. Uh, the, this, we, we've intentionally kept the, the language really simple so that you, know, you can talk about this to people who may not understand Ansible, and you can show them playbooks. And even a non-technical person should, in theory, be able to look at this playbook and kind of understand what's going on and, uh, and, and, and grasp uh, the idea. Um, and you can kind of see here an example. Uh, hopefully, it's, I guess it's pretty readable. So this is a, a full playbook. It's on, it only has one play, and the play has two tasks. So first, we have the name of the, of the play. Then we, we, tell, we, we tell Ansible which hosts it's targeting. So we're just targeting all hosts. Um, in the real world, this would probably be you know, hosts, web servers, to target your web servers. Um, and then the tasks here uh, are also named. These are freeform names. So you can, uh, you can say install a HTTPD, and then you call the yum module. You give it a uh, package name or list of packages, and then you, you ask Ansible um, what state you want those packages to be in. Do you want them present, or do you want them absent, or do you want them on the latest version, or do you want them on these specific versions? All of that stuff is, uh, it, it, you can express that in the playbook. And then we start the, the Apache service with the service module. And again, it's a declarative state. So you say name equals uh, the service name equals HTTPD, and the state we want it to be in is running. And if it needs to be changed, Ansible will make it so. Um, Ansible is a very extensible system. Um, as I mentioned before, you can build custom inventory sources. You can construct callbacks if you need to, to do some sort of sophisticated logging or, or logging to a centralized location. 
And um, you can also develop your own connection plugins. So if you have a device that maybe has a different kind of API or doesn't handle SSH, you could build a connection plugin to, to talk to that device. We have a couple of connection plugins out there. Of course, there's the SSH plugin, there's, or the SSH connection type. There's the 0MQ uh, fireball mode. And we also can, can talk to a cheroot. It's not exactly what's happening, but, but you can manage a cheroot, or you can manage it, your, you can construct a playbook to, to work within a cheroot, that is. So let me go through a really quick example, and then I'll, I'll actually show it to you. Um, this is a common model. It's, it's not complicated. It's something that everybody who runs a web application does. Uh, some people do it by locking their team in a room and, and, um, and going through the steps manually. Some people have this, this automated using custom scripts. But the idea is you've got a, a multi-tier web application. You have uh, your load balancer and your monitoring system, and you have your software living somewhere. You've got app servers, web servers, and not shown is, is the database server, which is usually present. Um, so the first thing you're going to do in the Ansible world is execute the playbook. And, uh, and what I'll show you in a couple minutes live is, is, the, is actually Ansible can signal the load balancer to say, you know, say we have 10 web servers. We're going to take uh, two at a time, or one at a time, or five at a time. We're going to take whatever that serial number you've chosen, take those first two out of the load balancing pool by signaling the load balancer, tell the monitoring system we're taking these down for maintenance so that nobody gets paged unless necessary. And then we're going to apply the update to the, uh, to the app servers or the web servers or, or both. Um, we'll move on to the, uh, to the next tier. And once those two servers are done, Ansible will, will go back to the load balancer and back to the monitoring server and undo the changes. So put them back in the pool, assuming the tests pass, and then move on to the next two and the next two and the next two until the entire system is updated. So uh, this is not an uncommon task. Ansible was designed to make modeling this task in an automated sense very easy. So let's see it in real life. Um, I've got a handful of VMs here. Hopefully I can get my, let's see, beautiful. OK. So I've got a handful of VMs here. I have, uh, oh, I'll just show you the inventory file here. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to comment out the second web server. I've got a web server, a database server, a load balancer, which is HA proxy. And then I've got a Nagios machine running. These, so these, these VMs right now are all bare CentOS installs. The only thing I've done is uh, set up an SSH key connection so I don't have to type the password every time. So I've got a playbook here that, is this on? This is on, isn't it? I've got a playbook here that looks like this. It's, uh, it's pretty simple. It's calling, calling into to roles that I've developed that, that uh, you know, have a common role which sets up NTP and configures my software repositories and so on. I've got a role for the database server. So this top level playbook is not very interesting. Um, all it's doing is breaking down the hosts in my inventory and applying roles to them. So let me run this. And this will take a few minutes to go through. And, and while it happens, I'll, I'll talk about what's happening. You see this gathering facts right here. Uh, if, you're a, if you're a Puppet user or, or know something about Puppet, you might recognize the term facts. Facts are just gathered information about the remote system. So Ansible goes out and gathers the, the facts. That is a little hard to read, isn't it? But what this says here is changed. In yellow, it's changed. Green is OK. Um, changed means, of course, Ansible changed something on the target host. Green means nothing has changed. So if my internet connection is fast enough, and I should really set up a proxy on my laptop to, to make this quicker, um, in just a couple of minutes, we will get uh, a, a fully installed um, Nagios HA proxy, uh, Apache, uh, et cetera, stack ready to go. And I'll be able to show it to you. Um, and then the, the next thing I'll be able to do, let me just open up a new terminal here. Hopefully that's visible. What I'll be able to show you is the idea of a rolling upgrade. So let's <coughs> see. This is going to be a little tough. There we go. So this is how we would express a, a rolling upgrade 
using Ansible. It's only a few lines of playbook content. But um, if you can see here at the, at the top, uh, at the top for, for each, let's see, we're targeting the web servers and we're using a serial of one. This means we're going to target one machine at a time. We're going to complete the entire process for web server one, then move on to two. Ordinarily, in a large environment, you'd set that to five or 10 or you know, however many you wanted to target at once. So what we're going to do is for each web server, we're going to uh, disable Nagios for that host. We're going to disable the server in, in HA proxy. And you can see we've got a Nagios module that just says action disable alerts. We give it the host name. Um, and then we, we, we delegate to all of the monitoring servers that you have in your environment. And then we move, on to the, we move on to the load balancer to disable that particular server. And then there's a couple different ways to approach the next step. But in this case, we simply reapply the existing sort of uh, uh, encapsulated roles to, those, to, the, to the web servers that, that we're talking to. And this will update the application to the version that you specify. After those roles have been reapplied, uh, and that'll also, up, that'll also apply any other configuration changes as well. So if you have modified the list of packages that you need installed on each of your systems, that will also apply to the rolling upgrade. Let's just check this over here. So we're installing MySQL. Um, once, the, uh, once we've reapplied the role, which means uh, applying the update, we undo the changes we, did, we made to the, to the load balancer and to the monitoring server. So we re-enable the server in HA proxy, and we re-enable the Nagios alerts so that if the system goes down unexpectedly, you get a page. Um, there's other things you can do here. Uh, one thing that a lot of people like to do is put a, a, a little test case in before we re-enable the server. So if for some reason the upgrade failed, we can, we can test and we can bail and not go on and propagate that bad change to the rest of your servers, which is very easy to do in an automated environment. OK, so this is just about done. Um, let me show you what one of the playbooks looks like uh, inside the roles. We'll go ahead and look at, um, let's see, let's look at the base Apache. Well, we've already seen that, basically. We'll look at the web application that we're deploying. Um, this, is a, this is sort of a fragment of a play or a fragment of a playbook. It's just a list of tasks. and. Hopefully, it's starting to look a little bit familiar. Um, we've got the, we're calling the yum module to install some packages. We're calling the uh, SE Linux Boolean module to uh, do some SE Linux configuration. I usually just turn SE Linux off, but well, this supports, supports both. And then we, we clone a repository from, uh, from Git into the correct directory. So it's a trivial deployment. This can be extended to, to be more complicated. Um, most deployments are more complicated than this. But it could be a good starting point. All right, so we're still waiting on PHP and Git. However, I think, why don't we just be brave and see if the web, see if the load balancer is responding. Let's see. Nope, not yet. All right, we'll give it another minute or two. Um, let's see. Uh, Ansible has the concept of variables, and, and variables can come from a lot of different places. Uh, the, the most basic place you can get variables from is your group variables. And these are, these are uh, variable files that are applied to named groups in your inventory. So if we take a look at the web servers here, we can see that we are defining a, uh, an interface on which the web server should listen to, which, uh, which repository we should get our web, web application code from. And then the, uh, the, the repository hat or the, 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 uh, the commit hash of the, the version that we want. Come on, SE Linux, we're so close. There we go. All right, so you can see we're actually deploying, um, we're actually deploying the code to the, uh, to the web server. Now we're working on the load balancers. I apologize, I really should have had that proxy set up so I wouldn't be waiting for the downloads. Uh, let's see. All right, we probably have a minute left. Any more quest any questions in the meantime? If we can get ahead of that, maybe. Yes? Is there a switch on the front?
my voice is pretty loud, so I guess I Do you want to come up and use this mic? <laughs> There we go. Uh, you actually did not specify the network uh, plugin in the playbook file, so it takes a default, I guess, SSH, right? Uh, yes, yes. It defaults to SSH. And um, if I have to actually specify, then is there an option for that? I mean, let's say if I'm using any other conf networking plugin for that. Yeah, so if you want to use a different connection plugin, you can actually just say Ansible dash playbook. Uh, I think it's C. Something like that. Um, you can specify it on the command line. You can also specify it in the in the play. So this becomes important if you're dealing with you know local actions, which are kind of a you know slightly more advanced than than, than this talk. But um, if you're doing a local action, you're running something locally on the Ansible machine for some other purpose. So maybe you're calling an API to launch a cloud server, and then you're going to be operating on that cloud server. So you can. There's a special kind of connection plugin called local, which just runs locally. Um, and you can specify that. Uh, you almost always specify that in the play because you've got a specific reason to do that. Uh, but you can override the, the connection on the command line as well if, if, you, if you know what you're doing. Thanks. Other questions while we wait for, uh, wait for the repository? OK, let's see if our load balancer is up. There we go. Um, so we have a basic application. All it is is a file that serves a, a version, um, and it's uh, it's fairly f fairly simple. Um, I want to show you Nagios. Nagios is not installed yet, but uh, what I will show you next is actually a way to apply the up uh, to apply an upgrade to those to those web servers in a rolling fashion. And I really wish Nagios would install because <coughs> I'm impatient. So the rolling upgrade will look like this. So what we're saying here is we are, it's a little hard to read, but what we're saying is um, run the rolling upgrade playbook, and we're overriding a variable that lives in the system. So if you recall back to that group variable file that I showed you, we had a repository hash in there. And I could put in a specific repository hash in that file, or I could put it on the command line. In this case, I'm just going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and specify to to pull the the head of the repository. Come on, Nagios, you can do it. I'm not going to get brave and run uh, both of these playbooks concurrently because I don't really know what's going to happen. <laughs> What I am going to do, because I only have 10 minutes left and I want time for questions, I'm going to remove the monitoring host entirely and run the upgrade. So we're here at the hitting the load balancer. It's redirecting us to one of the web servers. Version 5 is the, the version of the code. And we're going to go ahead and run the rolling upgrade. Now, this is by necessity going to skip the actual step of talking to the monitoring server. But uh, what it will do is it will talk to the load balancer, take the affected server out of the pool, upgrade the uh, application, and put the thing back in the pool. And you can see it's actually going through the, all of the configuration steps. but. Uh, for, for web server, but none of them are going to change except for the actual code deployment because we've already done the things like inst uh, set up Apple and install the Nagios plugins and so on and so forth. And this is this is an example of Ansible's uh, item potency where you can run the same playbook over and over again. And if you've if you've written a playbook in such a way that it is item potent, nothing is going to change. You don't have to. You can write a playbook that just runs commands, and those commands will run. Uh, but you've got ways to to make it to give it that item potency. <laughs> Speed of the network aside, um, I'm impressed that you guys have conference-wide access here. Good work. Which 
Um, come on, use next two gigahertz. Yeah. All right, so we've applied the upgrade, and now we're on version six. Uh, nothing too exciting. It's a simple thing. People do this uh, all day, every day. But um, Ansible gives you a really quick and easy way to, to model this kind of thing. And it can be extended to, to much more sophisticated deployment tasks. A couple of examples. Uh, one of our customers, AppDynamics, uh, is a very quickly growing application performance uh, management company based in San Francisco. Uh, they're growing very, very quickly. Uh, they're deploying their application to their customers or into their data center environment on over you know 250 machines many times a day uh, and they're using Ansible to do that and they're expecting it to to scale to uh, to whatever extent they need need it to scale which you know they're, they're not slowing down anytime soon. Uh, Gawker Media, the guys behind uh, the Jalopnik blog and, and Gawker and um, Lifehacker I think, they're also using Ansible to deploy their um, their, their content management application many times a day. Basically triggered from um, commits to their source control. So this is, this is how we tie back to the continuous deployment. So somebody commits some code, it goes through a test, case, a test suite. Maybe it has a, a physical reviewer to sign off on it. In the case of AppDynamics, they're using Garrett to, uh, to do that approval. Um, as soon as that code is ready, it's, it's deployed to the system uh, completely automatically. And uh, it saves these companies many, many, uh, many, many man hours and man days of, of work to, uh, to, to, to streamline their deployment and get, it, get new features out to their customers faster. All right, so, whoops, just messed up my slide. Hang on a sec. I want to put this up here quickly. Uh, any questions? We have about five minutes left. If the git module doesn't do everything that is needed, special rev list commands or submodule configuration, is it better to modify the module, use the shell command, or create a new module? Good question. I think it, uh, we would love to see a pull request to improve the, the git module. Uh, if there are things that it doesn't do that, that are sort of normal git procedures, we would absolutely uh, bring those back into core. Um, if you're drastically changing the behavior, if, if you're breaking backwards compatibility, backwards compatibility is important to us. Uh, if you're doing that, we may, you know, may suggest a separate module. Um, if you're doing something that's probably not going to be useful to anyone else, uh, I would probably suggest just doing a, a set of commands using the command module. But if it's something you think other people would use um, and it doesn't break backwards compatibility, we would, we would very much love to see a, a pull request on, on GitHub for that. More questions? Great, thanks. I've got some stickers and business cards up here if you're interested. Thanks, Chris.